Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Sherelle Peak, and I'm the family pastor here, and we're so glad that you have joined us this morning. If you've been with us for a couple of weeks, you know that we've been in this series, How to Live with Confidence. And that's kind of a bold statement, because if you just take a moment and you look around with everything that's happening in the world, how in the world can we say that a person can live with confidence? Looking at the macro, the big stuff, okay, Israel and Gaza, the never seemingly unending war with Russia and Ukraine, and then when we bring it back to the United States, the looming recession, the election, and that's the big stuff, right? Because we all have stuff that is going on in our own lives, like anxiety or depression or stress, being overworked. How can we live with confidence? Well, I'm glad you asked. You didn't ask, but I'm glad you asked. We're going to be in Ephesians 6. Starting in verse 13, if you have one of the church Bibles, that's going to be on page 801. If you do not have a Bible, we would love to give you a Bible. You can find them on sort of like the bookshelves on the, on, in the back, uh, right before the doors. And before we jump into this passage, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come before you. God, we ask you to speak to us this morning. God, we need your word. We need your voice. God, help me to get out of the way and communicate to your people what you would want them to hear. Lord, thank you for being with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. In Ephesians 6, we're going to see how we can live with confidence. This is what it says. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And this is where we're going to park today. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. There are two questions that I believe that every single person has to answer in their life. And we're gonna look at both questions. The first question is, do you have a savior? And the second is, how confident are you in their salvation? When I think about that question, do you have a savior? And when I think about confidence, these are the things that come to mind. I believe that every single person has a savior. Now, whether they think that it's their wealth or they think that it's their status or their job or their influence, everybody looks to something to save them. Maybe it's religion. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe this is even you. No one's going to save me. No one's coming. I need to save me. And even you, your savior is yourself. Do you have a savior? Does anybody, anybody a movie buff? Anybody like movies? Yeah, yeah. Sci-fi movies? Yeah, yeah. Avengers, Infinity War, anybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you guys remember the scene 
where the heroes are traveling to confront Thanos on the spaceship. And they are joined by another set of heroes, but they do not know whose side they're on. And Doctor Strange says to Star-Lord, who is your master? Who do you serve? And Star-Lord says, what, do you want me to say Jesus Christ? And Iron Man's like, this guy's from Missouri. <laughs> Anyways, with that being said, for some of us in this room, when I ask you the question, do you have a savior? That answer is Jesus, and you're certain of it. And that's incredible. And I don't want you to tune out, because the moment that we talk about salvation is the moment like, oh, man, he's talking to the non-believers. But here's the crazy part about the passage that we're just about to jump into with Jesus is Jesus is not reassuring the non-believers. He's reassuring his disciples because they too were in troubled times and they needed confidence. So let me set up John 13 for you. We'll actually be in John 14. But in John 13, Jesus is having his final meal with his disciples. And he's running them down through the list that he is going to lay down his life, that one of them will betray him, and that Peter is going to deny him. Now, as you can imagine, the man that they have spent the last three and a half, four years with is saying he's about to leave them. And they have put all, they've pushed in all their chips. Jesus is it. And now he's about to leave them. And they're concerned. So in John 14, verse 1, we're going to pick it up. He says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have not, would I have told you that I am going there to, to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Now check this out. Do you guys remember last week when we talked about Thomas? What was his nickname? Doubting Thomas. Because Thomas has doubts, he has questions, this leads us to probably one of the greatest proclamations in all of Scripture. This is one of the most awesome things that Jesus, Jesus tells us. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. So how can we know the way? How can we have confidence? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As I was studying this passage, I was looking up in this commentary. So this isn't from me. This is what it had to say about Jesus, and it reveals to us what the helmet of salvation is. Salvation is not a path or process. Salvation is a person. When we put on the helmet of salvation, we are putting on Jesus. Now, I'm certain that for some of us in the room that have struggled with salvation, whether you believe or you don't believe, and how do you get saved, and how do you know if it worked, one of these things that this reveals to us is it's not a process. Salvation is Jesus. Let's break down 
what he says because he tells us three statements. He says, I'm the way. Now, this is the most offensive thing about Christianity. Do you know how much more palatable Christianity would be if Jesus was a way? If he was one of many ways? We'd have tons of buddies. You want to go through, get to heaven through this person? You want to get to heaven through that? Go. Yeah, that's great. Uh, no problem. Like, Jesus, he's cool. He's a way. But here is the incredible thing about Jesus being the only way. Is it leaves no doubt. You don't have to get to the end of your life and wonder. Did I follow the right God? He's the only way. It also says he's the truth. You guys have heard this probably to your nauseous. My truth, your truth. In a world where people have taken opinions, okay, and made them facts, we can definitively know that there is one truth, and that's Jesus Christ. It also says he is the life. And here's the incredible part about the person of Jesus that says he is the life is he can then give us that life as a gift. So, do you have a Savior? We see in, in John, 100%. Our Savior is Jesus. He is our helmet of salvation. But the second question is, is how confident are you in their salvation? So let's say, just for a moment, because you're like in their salvation, maybe your person, that your salvation is in the work that you do, or your salvation is in another God, or your salvation is in you. How confident are you that that saves, that your good works, that your God will save. What I love about the next passage that we're about to read in Thessalonians, Paul is writing this to the church there, and they too are in troubled times, much like times of today, where people are going on oblivious to what, people are just living their lives oblivious, marrying, getting pregnant, just living life, normal things, partying, getting drunk, unaware of of the battle that we're in. And this is what he says to encourage the church. And this is what I want to make sure that we don't miss. Because check this out. There's several different times in Scripture where we see the helmet of salvation. One's in Isaiah. This one's in 1 Thessalonians. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him this may sound funny, like not actually when you're awake or asleep, but whether we have died before he returns or when he returns, we're still alive, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, just as in fact, you are doing. There are two things that Paul is confident about in this, in this chapter. There's two things. And I want to point them out to you. The first one is God's wrath. I would be a fool not to share this with you. That every single person 
is going to stand before God one day and give an accounting of your life. That can feel like a heavy thing. It can even feel like a scary thing. But God gives us the confidence. And Paul talks about the second thing that he's confident is, is in our salvation. That Jesus died in our place. So, how can we have confidence in, the, in our helmet of salvation? Because I'm pretty sure in a room this size, and at some point in time in your life, have you wondered, did that work? Am I saved? Did I know enough when I got baptized? I feel like I need to get baptized again. And we have this lack of confidence and it just spurs on this anxiety. And God doesn't want us to have anxiety. God wants us to be certain. So what I want to do over the next couple minutes is I want to, as clearly as I can, show you what salvation is and show you what it isn't. Now, check this out. Whether you have been a believer for 1, 5, 20, 40 years, like say, there's all, we've all had moments of doubt. And what I want to do is if you're a non-believer and you've been wrestling with God, I want to make sure you know before you leave this place today what this helmet of salvation is. So in Romans 3, 23, it tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What this basically means is you don't know a single person in your life that's a good person. No matter how much money they've given, no matter how many charities they work at, even if the only thing they've ever done in their life is lied. They've never hurt a person. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. This is the problem when it comes to people. We like to compare, right? We like to look at another person and think, I haven't done that, so I must be good. But we have forgot that the standard is perfection. The standard is God. And anything less than that produces separation. God's holy, God is perfect. Any amount of sin creates separation between us. You have sinned, I have sinned. Every single person that has ever lived on this earth outside of Jesus has fallen short of the glory of God. And that earned us something. We understand the concept of going to work. We put in work, we get paid. We don't put in work, we don't get paid. Well, our works that we have done here on the earth, the paycheck that it has earned us is death. Now, if you guys remember back to the garden, when they're told that they will die if they eat of the tree, they didn't die. And my guess is, is if you're in this room, you didn't immediately die either the first time you lied. But this isn't just talking about a physical death. This is talking about the spiritual death, the separation between us and God. This is what I love about Romans 5. But God demonstrates his own love towards us 
in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Check this out. This is, that was the bad news. Everything up before Romans 5 verse 8 was the bad news. That was the wrath of God that we're all to answer for. But in Romans 5, 8, we get a glimpse at God's heart. It's not when you've attended 20 straight weeks of church. It's not when you've read your Bible for 30 straight days. It's not when you've signed up and become a member at a church. It's not when you haven't sinned for 24 hours. Jesus died for us when we were still his enemies. When we had nothing to bring to the table, Jesus laid down his life. When it says, put on the helmet of salvation, it's because he's salvation. There's nothing that we can do. We can't earn it. He is it. We didn't finish Romans 6, 23, but it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God could have set up the scenario in any way that he wanted to. He could have literally said, This salvation is, this is what it's going to cost. But instead, he offers it as a free gift to everyone who believes. Now, for most of us, we've been tracking. Great. Awesome. Heard all of those things. But I've had doubt, and I've wondered how do I know if it's worked? In Romans 10, 9, it reveals to us that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now let's break it down because anyone in this room could say Jesus is Lord. But what does that mean? This confession that Jesus is Lord means Jesus has authority in my life. He is my Lord. He is my King. I submit my will to His. It's not simply words. It's you coming up under the authority of Jesus. And then it says, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. This belief isn't just a simple knowing that Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and raised three days later. This is the belief that he's talking about. One of my middle schoolers, Ethan Redman, came up to me right after the service and he said, I got a great example. I was using the old outdated chair one where when you came in this room, did anybody check your chair? No, you didn't because you knew that you knew that you knew that that chair was sound and that you would be able to sit. That kind of belief that you can put your whole weight on the chair. But Ethan said, Israel, his dad's a pilot. It's kind of like when people get on planes. They don't meet the pilot. They haven't seen his degree or credentials, but they get on that plane. And even though there might be some turbulence and even though life might be a little rocky, they know they're going to land. 
the sort of belief that changes your life. When you look back to those moments where you've prayed, just real honestly, did it lead to life change? And if it led to life change, not I want to earn it and I want to do a whole bunch of good things, but because I have placed, because God is my authority and I follow him, I want to glorify him. If it's led to life change, 100%. But if you are just like, man, I, I just said some words and I keep going back to my old life and nothing's really changed in my life, I want to, I want to challenge you to submit under the authority of Jesus Christ in your life. That when your feelings don't align with God's word, you don't go with your feelings. You go with the word of God. But you say, Jarrell, I've done that. My life has changed. I can look back a year. I can look back three years. I can look back five years. And my life has changed, but I still have struggles. I still have doubts. What does God's word have to say about that? And in Romans 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Listen to me. If you have submitted your life to the authority of Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit has come inside of you and has changed your life, nothing can separate you from God. But this is the challenge of every single day until you take your last breath, are you going to go out into the world with the armor of God on? Or are you going to try to do it in your own strength? Because I promise you, you're going to get beat up. You're going to get worn down. But God has not only equipped us, he's given us the equipment the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, our feet fitted with the gospel of peace, our shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just come before you right now. God, and I just want to ask anyone that believes in the room right now, anyone that has already given their hearts to Christ, God, that they would just begin to pray. To pray for the people that are wrestling in their soul. That haven't put their full weight and confidence in the Lord. I want them to pray like eternity is in the balance because it is. And God, there is no one more powerful than you. There is nothing more powerful than the Holy Spirit. So God, I pray that if someone has heard what the helmet of salvation is, it's you, and they are tired of doing it whatever way they were doing it before, and they are now ready to accept you as their Lord and their Savior, God, I pray that they would pray these words with me this morning. Jesus, I have sinned. Please forgive me. I believe that you died for my sin. That you were buried in the tomb. And that you were resurrected to new life. I confess 
that you are my Lord and my Savior. And I will follow you all the days of my life. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.